welcome all of you to uh, the second edition of the alumni post talks. Uh, the people you can see here is the whole team for today. Um, so we have an interviewee, Helga Mülnerich, and two interviewers, Amelia and Isabella, who, uh, and I will introduce all of you later on uh, in rather some detail. Um, but right now, I just want to say that we are really excited that the second edition of the post talks with a focus on the humanities can take place today with uh, all of you present. And um, I will give over now to Martina Meyer Kraus of Alumni Uni Graz to welcome you. Ma Martina, please. Yeah, thank you, Johanna. Yeah, a warm welcome also from my side uh, in the name of our alumni team. It's great to have you all here today. As a, like Johanna mentioned, I'm Martina and I'm responsible for our international uh, alumni network. Yeah, today we have our second event with three special guests. Thank you very much for, yeah, for supporting us and, yeah, and speaking today. And before we start, uh, I would like uh, to share our motivation with you why we set up uh, this online event like this, as we have three reasons. Uh, one reason or the important for us is to highlight the research activities of successful graduates of the University uh, of Graz. Uh, and uh, another motive is to show international career perspectives for young researchers and students. And uh, last but not least, we also would like to promote our international alumni network uh, and, and make it also visible. Uh, at the moment, we count about 30 alumni groups in 28 countries organized by volunteers who have studied at our university in Graz. And now uh, they act as local contact person for the university and for former students and they contribute their experience and know-how as chapter leaders or organize events. Like we have in Sweden, Martin Zottler, who is the contact there, and he organizes uh, often together with uh, his colleagues in Denmark, Finland, and Norway uh, events and uh, online events that makes it easier to come together. And yeah, I will put later a, a link of the group uh, uh, in the chat if you're interested to get in contact with Martin or, or join some events, or you, you plan to go to Sweden, maybe. Uh, like Helga did. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, for joining. Uh, thank you for being here. Yeah. And I would like to hand over to Johanna to introduce our guests. Uh, and thanks to all who are involved. Thank you, Martina. So um, I didn't say who I am. I'm an anthropologist and I've been coordinating the postdoc office. Uh, since last year. And uh, so shedding the light on the research of postdocs at Uni Graz and also making visible connections they have uh, on the international stage uh, is the goal for this event series. And it's one of our first event series. So we are really happy um, that you are all here. And uh, we, um, I would like to introduce now Helga Mülnerich, um, who will be interviewed by two scholars from Graz and all of them have uh, humanities backgrounds. So Helga Mülnerich is joining us live from Uppsala. Um, Isabella Manago is a researcher in Graz, but is currently live from Spain. And Amelia Kennedy uh, also has an international background, but is currently sending, as you can see, uh, from right in front of the Haupt building uh, at the University of Graz. Helga Mülnerich holds an MA and a BA from the University of Graz and is currently a postdoc in German at the Department of Modern Languages at Uppsala University. Helga focuses in her research on female agency, manuscript, cookery books and book history in the long 18th century. She currently carries out the research project called Women in the Shadow female agency in the 18th century, where she maps out the social and economic positions women and men held in German-speaking countries based on material remnants. 
Her work contributes to the material turn in the humanities and centers mundane everyday life notes and artifacts of people who often remain in the shadows due to their minimal connections to famous figures of history. Helga has worked as a lecturer in German studies at Bangor University 2019 and 2020. She held several short-term positions at the University of Liverpool between 2013 and 2019 and has also taught as a German language tu tutor at the University of Nottingham, Ningbo in China. Um, in 2017 and 18. Helga was awarded her doctorate by the University of Liverpool in 2019. Helga, is that all correct? That's all correct. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now to our interviewer team. Um, we have Isabella Manago. She studied German studies and history in Heidelberg after a brief stint uh, in Tübingen, I believe, Isabella, did I? Yes, uh, where she did lots of things. Uh, and during her PhD, Isabella worked as a research associate in the DFG project called Johann Fischatz de Monomania Magorum, comment on the German translation of Bodin's demonology. She worked with Tobias Bulang there, and she also received a dissertation grant from the State Graduate Fund in Heidelberg. She was an associate member of the Literary Doctoral College, What is Tradition, on the genesis, dynamics and criticism of concepts of transmission in Western European literatures. And since autumn 2020, she joined us at the University of Graz and is a postdoc with Professor Julia Zimmermann. Um, her PhD thesis was published in 2021 and is called Schicksal, Zufall, Willensfreiheit, Kontingenz im Trojanerkrieg, Konrads von Würzburg. So this is also a very interesting research area. Isabella, did I say everything correct? Super, thank you. And we have Isabella's co-interviewer, who is Amelia Kennedy. And she has been a university assistant postdoc in medieval history in Graz since May 2021 and majored in history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and then received her PhD in 2020 from Yale University. Amelia's dissertation was titled Growing Old in a Cistercian Monastery 1100 uh, to 1300. Uh, and Amelia's research integrates approaches from aging studies, disability studies, and the medical humanities within the context of medieval monasticism. And for me, especially interesting sounds Amelia's article on crib time in the monastic infirmary. And I will for sure ask about this later on. <laughs> Amelia focuses on the social and cultural history of Europe during the high Middle Ages and is currently beginning new research on women's communities and concepts of exile. She's also interested in the digital humanities. So you can see overlapping research interests and many uh, things uh, you can study in the humanities, which makes me uh, especially excited as an anthropologist and gender studies scholar. Um, and now to the audience, all of you uh, get to ask questions later on and you can already type them in the chat as they come to you and I will moderate the audience discussion later on. But now let me give the word over to our interview team for the first question. Oh, thank you for the yeah the generous uh, introductions. Um, so I guess we should just start out like Helga, would you, I mean, you've already been introduced wonderfully, um, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about what your research, what you're currently researching and what you've been up to lately. So, so maybe I should just start with showing one thing I got from Uppsala already. <laughs> this is the, yeah. yes, I, I, I had, so you know that I finished uh, my doctorate in 2019 and then I wanted to publish sooner, but you know how things are. And then I came here and, and I thought, so now it's time because we have to. Uh, and then I talked actually to our head of department and he said, well, I have a, so he has a Peter Lang uh, series. And so it came that, that I managed to get it published in the Peter Lang series. So it's all peer reviewed and it's really, so I was very grateful because that's a, that's a big milestone. 
Ja, genau. congratulations. Ah, thank you. <laughs> It's so weird because when you when you do it and after all the revisions it comes and it's it's a very short happiness for what it really means. So I think it's good to be mindful and celebrate successes <laughs> and not just say, okay, it's for the next. But anyway, so here I have, so throughout the doctorate, I have worked on cookery books, so 18th century uh, manuscript cookery books. And, and then I thought, so the thing with the cookery books is that, you, uh, so different to uh, what most people think or what even research studies say, very often you don't have a name uh, and very often you don't have any clue where did this book really come from. So you know, okay, it's somewhere from German speaking countries, but you can't really pinpoint how it belongs to this city or this uh, town or whatever. Uh, and I have tried to, to so have built a corpus to see, you know, female, uh, female um, education and so on. And then I thought it would also be interesting to see uh, for the for the postdoc project how, what what how does the female agency really look like? I mean, it's clear that the usual that we always hear that we, women were just in the house and you know that you had the separated spheres with the public and the private sphere in the 18th century and that no that it almost never overlapped. So this has been broken in the last years. So for example, in Uppsala, there was a uh, gender work and um, I forget how it's called it. So basically gender and work. It was a project that I think it was for three years or four. And I used the, the findings already for my PhD. And I thought it is interesting to me how do women talk about themselves and what kind of job did they really do? And especially not, so when we think of 18th century, we usually think of the bourgeoisie women, but what did the others do, you know? So, yeah, It's really interesting because when I think of the 18th century, I, 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 immediately, I immediately think about the enlightenment. Yeah. Um, that's, of course, very important for European history in general, but... I think if you can say something negative about the Enlightenment is that women don't really, I don't know, like have the opportunity to to write and to think and to be heard. Yeah, and and what what comes to us, I mean, the canon is very selective. Uh, I mean, it, it makes sense. So I don't want to always bash it, you know. But I think. Uh, so even, even now it is that, so I just take the Mozarts, for example, because the Mozarts, so the, the letters have been perfectly, so it's, it's beautiful. So, um, a Mozarteum in Salzburg has digitized them, transcribed them, translated them. So they have done a wonderful work. And I thought, why not start with the Mozarts? No? Uh, and when I looked, so I, Of course, everyone knows, knows Mozart in Austria because it's this foundation person, you know. But uh, that the mother, for example, is never really cared about. So it's just his mother, she wasn't educated. So you even have quite horrible uh, biographies so of half literary, half, re I don't know, factual biographies that that really come with the weirdest things. She wasn't social labor. She was too crude she wasn't educated i think I, i cannot see that in the letters and it's it's quite unfair because she had so she was actually a very social labor person but what actually interested me is what did she really do for the family workshop because so mozart's father uh had written a violin school so a book and he had published it and he always made sure that uh he would get you know so he, he always said uh, again i say so in his letters when he's on uh, travels with Mozart, so with Wolfgang Amadeus, uh, he writes back, in, you know, he writes to his wife, yeah, uh, go to the publisher and do this, or go to there, do this, you know. So you can see how much she was involved to make the family workshop going. So she was important to, 
to get the you know write letters, get the cash, go there, bring the books there. Um, and this involvement is not is usually not or is never. So I haven't seen it really touched upon. Uh, maybe I have overlooked something, but let's say in 99.99 percent. Uh, Mozart's mother is not seen as someone who ensured that the business side of the Mozart family was kept afloat. That makes any sense. Yeah, it does. <laughs> really interesting. Yeah, yeah so, so you're working. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So you're working on the uh, Uppsala, and how long have you been at Uppsala? So I have come uh, in in uh, December 2020 and I can tell you so it was so here the postdoc was until a few months ago two years so the contract goes from the uh, I want to say from the 1st of December 2020 to the 30th of November 2022 uh, so it's very very I'm gonna say um Short. Very, very short and very strict <laughs> and very clear. So you know exactly there's no dancing around. It's all written. <laughs> uh, I mean, what I do like about um, the contract, I must say, is that the Swedish are very concerned that everything is proper. So, so in my English contracts, I had between 36.5 and I'm not lying. So I'm not quite sure, but let's say 45 hours a week which is quite, you know, uh, and here it's like very clearly calculated, okay, so and so and your holidays, your holidays. So there's really this wish to, uh, that you stay healthy and, you know, that you're not overworking, at least not contractually, if that makes sense. Yeah. So do you find, I mean, do you work basically as much as your contract says or <laughs> in reality, yeah. do you go over? I think you always go over somehow. It's just when, you know, so I think there, there are phases where, where you kind of, it's I always compared a bit with crunching, you know, in the, in the game industry where you have a, an easier and then suddenly you have the deadlines and suddenly you have to crunch and, and you work through the night because you have to. And so I think it, I, I don't write it in my book, but I'd say it, it even sounds probably a little more uh but it's it's more enjoyable because you're not being pushed all the time so that's that's the nice thing oh, so you can really focus on what you want to do yeah so i'm i'm very lucky because i am so i have free hands i have 80 percent research 20 percent teaching so the teaching is literature uh two literature courses and the nice thing is also, so I didn't know that, but it seems that in Sweden, uh, the classes are often a little blocked. So I have uh, one week, two hours, and then the week is, so next week is no teaching. And then again, two hours so that the students can really read the so the books or whatever we need them to prepare. And I thought that's kind of nice, you know, so they really have a week of breathing space to read through the novels and think about the questions and so on um yeah and otherwise i'm so in this department so i'm not sure how others do i'm sure that um something that's not humanities or even another section of the humanities might be different but here i can do what i like so what what interests me i can follow and it's really very nice so I don't have to be on someone's project or, you know, work for someone's project. I don't know how this is in Graz. Just as a... I think it's similar. I mean, I'm not attached to a specific project either. And so, I mean, there's certainly, I think the, like within the university, within the departments and within just my supervisor's research, there's certain themes that sort of you're supposed to work on. Um, but I'm not like bound to a particular project and I have to work on that. Um, I don't know, Isabella, is it the same for you? Yeah, it's the same for me. Yeah. But it's, it's on, on one hand, it's really good because you can do what, what you like to do. But on the other hand, you have to think quite a lot what you want, what it is you want to do. <laughs> yeah, that, that's um, a problem. Yeah. Difficult as well because 
sometimes it feels you're like you're alone um, and you you have to think alone about that stuff and then you find something you're really interested about and then you're the only person who who knows about that topic and um so it has both sides sometimes i like working in a project because um you're working together with people and you can exchange thoughts and research and stuff that's also very nice yeah it's also i mean when it's in the early stage and you are still searching which material do you want and what it is very very un you know it, it doesn't have real form and i think if you work on something clear then you know aha i have to do abc but here you are for yourself responsible to make your own plan and accept changes i mean i think so my dissertation project already did not uh go as I thought it would because I changed the focus in halfway through because I noticed it didn't work as I thought. So I think it's it's important to keep to accept that you might have to change and that it's okay to do that. And that you know and I think what what now might be a problem and I didn't I had no problems with it but uh getting material has been so I know for other postdocs really a problem because you couldn't go into the archives for I don't know one and a half years two, yeah. two years almost mm. yeah, yeah I but, think we all sort of started our positions basically in the middle of COVID yeah. I remember when I flew so of course as you so, so I have learned to pick less and less so you you really just have what you need uh, because when I came first over to Britain to start my PhD, of course I thought, no, I cannot go without my books and this and this and this. And of course, when you move five times, then you think again. And if you move overseas, you realize I don't need, I mean, a hundred kilos of books is not really much in reality. I mean, it sounds too much, but you know, it's, it's not so many. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot to, to pack, but not a lot to like to your research yeah <laughs> yeah so i have i've really gone to uh, i mean i like books but it's just too much you know so for, for china for example the paid allowance was 120 kilos and 50 kilos and i had reduced really extremely 50 kilos was only my books because wow. yeah and you know how this is it gets heavy so easy and you can't believe it you know your clothing is and the shoes is usually not so so I have learned, uh, yeah, to to pick less and le or it's it's also yeah you travel rather lightly. I mean, I, mean, I have sent a lot of stuff to my parents, so they, because of course I couldn't throw the books away. I mean, you know, so only a monster would. Uh, so I packed it and I sent it with Hermes or something. I thought put it, yeah. you know, yeah. Hmm. You moved really a lot. How was it for you personally to always leave friends and family behind and start new again? Yeah, I mean, I think the hardest was the first because I didn't know. I mean, I have never, I'm not from a family where you, you know, move around or so I have, we have not even moved house. So, you know, it's where, where you're born, you stay. And so moving to England was was quite tough and also I mean it is even if you think we are very similar it's still a cultural shock because there are always things that are not you know that some country does differently so how things work you know and so this was the hardest because it was yeah it was quite a lot to digest and then when you move the next time you know so you build up a repository of tools that you use you know so you know how I do this, so I do so, but even, you know, that you create things that remind you of where you are. So what I mean is like, I have a coffee, you know, this Italian coffee machine, and I always take this around. And when I put the coffee machine, on, so then I know, ah, okay, so the coffee will be fine, that's important. So it's a it's little anchors that you use to, you know, anchor yourself. And otherwise I would say, so, 
I mean, in, in Liverpool, I have stayed the longest, but I also moved around a lot in Liverpool. And what I did, though, I have joined a, 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 an artist's, so it's a, an art club for, it's a, for um, amateur artists. And it was nice to talk to people who are not from the ecosystem university, because mm -hmm. which is not negative, but I think, you know, that the university is very, you know, diverse and you have people from everywhere and uh, everyone is kind of used to traveling around a lot and living somewhere else. Um, and, and when you talk to other people, then it's, it gives you kind of different, not only perspectives, but just different topics to talk about, you know. And so I thought that was quite a good move also because you have a kind of place to, you know, how can I say, a place where you go to or, or things to do if you, I don't know, to not feel lonely. Although feeling lonely is not really, so I have, I have always been in, so I usually phone with my friends. Um, and so that, that never changed really. So we have always just found like a long hour or so, so, you know. How do you? Yeah, I find, <laughs> like, I'm, I, I don't think I've felt lonely at all over in Graz because I'm just like, well, first of all, I have Isabella. And second of all, I'm just too busy to be lonely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is nice. But um, mm. so you mentioned also working in China. I'm like really curious actually to hear more about that. Was that after your PhD? No, it was in between. Because, because of course, I so around 2017, of course, I thought I would finish much sooner. That's quite clear. Because I thought, no, so and so. I don't even know why I thought that. It's just, you know, sometimes you are. Uh, I mean, I finished actually in the perfect time. I was part time uh, because I had a, so in, in Liverpool, I got a um, AHRC uh, fees only uh, stipend. So they paid my fees. I was a part time student. I mean, this is, I think, very different to uh, to Austria, where I don't think you have a part-time PhD because you're not, I don't know. But uh, anyway, so the, and the fees were paid. Yeah, and then I had seven years, so you have seven years part-time to finish. And I finished in six and a half, I think, or something. So yeah, it was... But I felt that it was time, and so I started applying. And of course, the applying process, the application process is just, yeah, tedious. And then I got an interview with, with China because I, I just thought I was interested. And then I thought, I mean, you will never experience China as safely than in the arms of a British university <laughs> because I don't even, I know, so now I know how difficult it is to get a visa. And I don't want to know how difficult it is to try to get a visa without having a unit, so without having an employer to do that for you. So I, I don't even think it's possible. Anyway, so yeah, so I got that and I thought I will finish the PhD when I'm there. Okay. So yeah, and then I moved and so short, I did not finish, but I finished when I came back, basically. Uh, because I, I decided to keep, so I had I had bits and pieces written already. So in, in England, you're very much uh, held on a very short leech, uh, leech, which was what I wanted. So I didn't want to be too free so that you never work on it and then 10 years later you have nothing but there you have to every year you have a check you have to present you have to meet your supervisor every month you have to hand in progress so you're very much you know on a very tight um yeah schedule and i mean it works because you are forced to you know to do something and to not just let it go uh yeah and anyway so yeah, China was was quite an experience. Uh, did, did you want to know about China? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> it was really interesting. And I, I kind of asking myself, um, has all this moving and learning about different cultures and languages and people, um, how did it influence your research? 
I mean, it has influenced it a lot because, I mean, so let's to, to put it in short is that I will always see Graz as a kind of my, my can I say the birthplace, or the, you know, where you grew up. Your home you, base. Yeah. <laughs> and also the way how you do research in Austria or in Graz, you know, just, of course, it is differently done in England because, you know, different traditions and different. So there's a clash already where it was really difficult because I thought, but that's the way to do it, you know, because you've learned how, how this is right to do. And it's outrageous to other people, you know. But then you start to appreciate, I mean, I have still certain troubles uh, with, uh, you know, this extreme narrative. It's very often overdone, in my opinion. So, so the Anglo-American approach with this storytelling. So sometimes I just feel, come, don't tell me, just show me a fake for once and, you know. But yeah, but otherwise I think uh, I have also, the nice thing is that well, nice, I don't know. So the modern languages is very small in Liverpool and in, in most British universities. Uh, and most people are extremely uh, uh, inter, uh, no? uh, I don't want to say intersection, it's interdepartmental, you know, uh, interdisciplinary. Interdisciplinary. Yeah. So you have already a very interdisciplinary focus where you're not a Germanist, but you have film studies and you have that. and. That's why I even thought about to look at the, at the cookery books from a different angle, because finally enough, I started from a very um, uh, linguistic, I'm not a linguist, I'm very bad at linguistics, but I thought that's, you know, how, I don't know, it's, it's how you learn how to do things and you think, yeah, yeah it makes sense. And then you do stuff and then you realize, but I'm not really, I don't enjoy, you know, segmenting, so why, why I'm doing it. And so that's why, I, why I decided to look at, this, at the material from a different point of view anyway. And I think it was possible because there was so much. So I was part of the 18th century World Center. And that was, so it's a center where you have scholars from, you know, 18th century music, 18th century uh, literature. And, 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 and so I have a lot of approaches to the 18th century. And it gives you a kind of a holistic perspective or more broad view on it, you know, on the, uh, on the um, century itself, also fashion, you know, and then I was also thinking, so you have a cookery book and it's, it is text, but it's also an object. So how was it used? Where was it used? Which role does it have in the life of people or did it have? Uh, so, you know, yeah. Yeah, really interesting. <laughs> and you're also not only an expert uh, in the 18th century, because I, I saw you, all, you also uh, did research in, in, in medieval uh, times about the cookery books. And um, does this play a role in, in your uh, dissertation or did it not? Or how, um, how would you compare the different times? I mean, what definitely plays a huge role or plays and still plays. So the approach that I'm having to material is extremely influenced by how it was bachelor's time, how I looked at cookery books and, you know, back then. Because so we have, of course, looked at the book, you know, is there a watermark? What kind of paper, parchment, what is this? Uh, which ink, which, and I noticed that I still do it. And it's something that I, I just want to say that someone who is actually, you know, who has started with the 18th century might maybe not look at, or maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. But I know that coming from there, it will always be, you know, the way how I look at, at the material, because it was very, you know, how can I say, very, very fundamental or an important period. It's, it's also interesting because, you know, when, when we look at different, so, you know, you look at different versions of something and you, you have that throughout, so it doesn't really break. Uh, so it's not that the 18th century is 
not producing certain versions of some cookery books or something, you know. Yeah. So I guess one, I thought we might pull in one of the questions from the chat, because this is a question yeah. I had as well, um, which is about like language skills, right? Is it, um, so Sabina Weiss is asking, so, you know, do you need Swedish language skills to get to have gotten your post in Sweden? And I'm wondering more generally, um, so we're doing this interview in English, obviously, um, but your first language is German. Um, and then you've also worked in various other places, all sorts of languages. So I guess just more generally, what role has language learning and played in your career? That's a very good question. <laughs> so, I mean, English was, so I did before, I, so you always have to be careful whatever you do, what is necessary. So when I looked up what you need to apply for, also to make clear, I have applied on my own uh, devices to the postdoc, which uh, not to the postdoc, to the PhD, which everyone say is crazy. So you shouldn't do that. For So that was for English. And there you need either a Cambridge certificate or you need, um, I forget what the name is. Uh, it, it does matter. So, so the university also, you can, you can make the test. It's the British uh, Council, I think, that makes them. IELTS, yeah, the IELTS because they needed to, so you need a certain baseline to be accepted into a British university. So you always have to be careful that you hit language, you know, targets. And on the PhD, so on the postdoc level, I did not need Swedish skills because the teaching is in German. Oh, and also, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also interesting that, uh, on some other universities uh, in Finland, for example, I know that if you were Swedish, you would have to possess Finnish, but as a non-Swede, you don't have to. So, yeah, I would say always, always look it up. Uh, but I mean, of course, it is expected that you learn Swedish, uh, and I'm doing it a little, so I'm, you know, every day a little. But I'm honest, and I say, for a two-year position, you have to think where you want to put your energy into. So should I get a full-time permanent position, I'd be happy to learn it properly, you know, like fast. And so for now, I mean, I can read a little, I understand what happens. I can follow very, you know, very uh, uh, patent conversations like, welcome everybody to blah, blah, you know, so you get certain things. Uh, but I, I also don't like to talk because I know it's just horrible because I cannot, so you notice with my English, I have never learned the, you know, the swing. And with Swedish, you have this certain melody in it too. Uh, yeah, another time. <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but I mean, it works, you can get by really well. It's so young people in 90% speak extremely good English. Uh, no one is kind of blah about it. Uh, sometimes, I mean, you have to, of course, you have to expect if you are not respectful then sometimes people won't be really welcoming but it has actually never really been a problem so if it has to be a, i mean of course with german i understand so it, for me it is as if swedish is between english and german so i understand things from both ways so in a really uh, you know for example the, the office is called contour and of course we have contour too as an old version of of office uh, and, and such things. So I understand basic stuff and we can, you know, work with each other without me speaking really Swedish. So yeah. Very good. Is, but is it, it is a not... problem with, with your teaching? No. No? Uh, I you must didn't say... speak all German. That's very impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, it's in Sweden, it's like excellent. So really, uh, uh, in, in England, I didn't do that because the level wasn't high enough in 90%. Uh, but here it is, so I really speak, um, I mean, sometimes you have to, it is usually, the, I mean, the students are usually very friendly and very, uh, you know, non-confrontational, so they like to help. It's, it's not always true, but let's say if, if I say, yeah, 
what would it be in Swedish? Then someone says it or whatever, you know, if it's necessary. Usually it's not. So they're actually quite good at, at working through the material. Of course, it's, I mean, I think you have to have three years of German or so, if I'm not wrong, but I might be wrong. So you have a certain level already when you enter and you are not an absolute beginner, which where some people are heading or several classes that are heading uh, in England or in China too. Um, but I have to say that of course in China, it was always English because it's an English language university and the students are expected to speak English to a, at least B2, I believe. Um, yeah, uh, which, and, and, and I know that it's hard for, for the students because they're always having this ping pong, you know, it's like the best for them would of course to have it in, so explained in Chinese, you know, Chinese German and not through via English thing to, yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I think that would be very difficult because you are teaching, you are teaching uh, German literature, so you have to teach German literature in English to, to people. Yeah, <laughs> in China, time, so. in China it was only language. So in, in China was only language tutor. Here it's, it's English, uh, it's uh, literature to German literature and in, in, to be fair, in Britain, you have you are only allowed to use books that have been published in German or in English. Uh, so both in English and German, so that you can read both versions of it. So uh, that's something you have to consider that this might be a demand that's necessary when you are planning your uh, your you know, your syllabus that you have to make sure that the translation is always there. So for everyone who feels they want to apply for the English positions, keep that in mind. Or you have to translate it yourself. Yeah, I find <laughs> the same thing sometimes teaching um, here, because also, you know, I'll have syllabi that I use in the US that have mostly English translations. And then I I know students here can, you know, they can read English as well, but I usually try to be nice and <laughs> find the same thing or something comparable in German translation. Or if it's short, I'll just do it myself and <laughs> hope yeah. they don't laugh too much at my Deutsch Feder. Um, yeah, you, but... you stop laughing once you have been. So um, I, and it is usually a tendency from people who haven't been anywhere and who have not really spoken another language for a longer period of time. Because you notice how hard it is to keep that going, you know, to, I mean, I'm sure you, or what do you think, how is it for you to speak German over a longer? Oh, gosh. Um, so I, before I came here, I'd had three semesters of German um, class. And then it, basically four years went by, right? And then I, I sort of, you know, I saw this job and was like, this is a, a great job. Like, let's apply. Um, so it's definitely sort of thrown off the deep end. I think at this point now I've been here, this is my second semester. I'm just getting, I think, more used to just blah, 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 blah like in German <laughs> without thinking as much about it. Um, mm. But it's definitely, yeah, I mean, I like, I have all the sympathy for anyone who is like, you know, teaching in a, a different language or whatnot, because it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it is sad yeah, because you're always falling, I mean, uh, you, you will not have the depth that you have in your native language. Or I say maybe in another context, but as you know, when you have studied German, you have a deep affinity for German already. So you're losing a lot of depth of, of your skills because in English, of course, you have to, yeah, you're not as good and you have to learn. And it's, you know, it, it was, as I have, I know several um, who have written their books in German at British universities, but um, I did not because I didn't know that the possibility existed. And my supervisor <laughs> said, oh, no, that's not a good idea to do. I said, OK. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, I mean, to, to language in China, I mean, you can get by with Google Trends. I mean, you have also to be careful. Google is not um, allowed in China, or it's not supported, so you can't use Google Maps. 
if you don't have a VPN. Um, and it's 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 difficult sometimes because you need so most people don't speak English or don't want to talk to you or think you're strange. And so the university has a very strong place. So they are without them you you I wouldn't have been able to get the visa or to to get around in the first time. So because you have to have a body exam, you know, you have to have a health check, or you have to as a Chinese cities are huge. They are so spoiled out. I couldn't imagine how it would be before I was there that you, you take a taxi and half an hour in the taxi is a very short, a bit American. It was the funny thing. It reminded me strongly of the US, you know, also the skyscrapers everywhere. Um, yeah. And so, so the, so the police also comes to you to check if your visa has been uh is is proper you know so like five i mean it's the, the police is not aggressive that's very nice but um they come like they like seven and you're just one person <laughs> it's nine at night and you sit there and they come and say yeah i just wanted to change so okay so yeah you have to get used to compliance just do it <laughs> and <laughs> yeah i mean it's i think it wasn't it was actually nice in terms that you have a kind of really diverse bubble because all the foreigners are you know kind of together so you go to a pub and you meet i don't know sami from uganda and it's really it's nice um but the thing is of course what i could never live with was the traffic uh, because they, they have e-bikes and they're very quiet and drive everywhere just you know and the cars when you cross the street and it's green for you the cars still cut in front and back and so I cannot it's for my nerves it's not good so where, no, yeah it's, I can imagine yeah I mean it's otherwise you can buy everything you know it's cheap the food is great I mean of course you have to be aware that if you would be a professional I was just a tutor I wasn't important but if you're important you have to speak with the party and make sure that you're not you know anti yeah anti uh Mm, political mm. yeah i mean otherwise asia is so i would i would be i would love to go to japan i would also love to go to taiwan uh and hong kong was also really actually my dream city is hong kong because it's just a perfect uh, but now it's of course with the political situation it's uh mm. yeah but maybe the first question i can i can see the chat too and it's a good question with, I did consciously apply uh, to Uppsala. I mean, I would have applied anyway, but when I saw it, I thought, you, you're mine, <laughs> I had to apply to it. Uh, because I have been, I had several, through the 18th century world center, I had already research connections with Uppsala. And I, so and they invited us, uh, so we were a group of students and I thought, it's lovely. And I, I've always had a kind of Sweden thing, and I think many Austrian German, and German children have because of uh, Astrid Lindgren and so on. No? Yeah. And so I was always extremely positive. And it's, it's clean. It's it's nice. It's uh, all very chill. So the you know the the cars drive very non-aggressive. So it's it's really nice. And a lot of parks and you know yeah and then and i knew nothing so i also warn you that i was lucky i got a contract and i didn't even know i thought yeah sure no. however there are scholarships you can also get a, a postdoc via a scholarship and then you are not eligible for healthcare. so i would warn you to check it very well what kind of contract thing you might get um, let me just uh, jump in here, Helga. Thank you, uh, and and to all three of you. Um, thanks for this uh, fascinating exchange between a U.S. perspective on Austrian academia, a German perspective on Austrian academia, and then Helga's perspective, which really. Uh, is even more international, <laughs> impressively enough. Um, 
maybe we have eight more minutes. Um, I will now try uh, to see if the audience has some more questions or Sabine, if your question has been answered sufficiently. So any of you who now have a burning uh, question can type it in the chat or just um, make themselves visible and hearable. <laughs> Sabine, hello. Can you try to speak, Sabine? Okay. So please double click at the symbol, yeah, at the bottom. Yeah, fine. And, and once again, Sabine, please. I didn't want to take the floor if any other people have any questions. No, please. But um, yeah, thank you very much. I was really interested in this talk. So thank you for organizing it. It was really lovely. Um, I have friends um, that are postdoc in Sweden and I visited them and I found the country very fascinating. And so I was interested to join this talk. Um, yeah, but, but I'm, uh, my research topic is in higher education studies and I already checked like it. Uppsala University and they don't really have that department. Um, yeah, but I, I will definitely see if there are any open positions when I'm finished with my PhD. Do you mean pedagogy? Or... Yeah, pedagogy, but I, higher I education. Think, no, no, you have to, you have to write Uppsala. This is the place for teaching. So I would mm -hmm. recommend you write to just write an email to the head of the department and say, I'm interested. And I mean, which language do you want to do German or, um, or just I think pedagogy? I think I would work in English and publish in English, but um, rather higher education and sociology of education. Yeah, I topic. would, uh, I would look uh, at pedagogy. So I think it's, yeah, check out the pedagogy because I know that Uppsala is the biggest in the country. So I would just try and ask and say I'm interested. Can you connect me with somebody? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Super. Is there anyone else uh, needing advice from Helga? From the participants? I will wait a few minutes or seconds. Yes, someone is tapping something. Arianna, uh, who is an Italian scholar currently in Graz, uh, if, uh, if this is the correct Arianna, is asking, do you use any particular strategies to keep in touch and carry co out common projects with Uni Graz and with the previous universities you worked at in England and China? Helga, please. I mean, strategies, well, not, not, not other people do it better. So I have never been a great networker because I'm too, but what I definitely do is when I see, um, so I'm just now putting together a volume on, uh, cookery books in a European context with someone I met at a conference in 2016 in New York and I just, you know, you can stay in touch via Twitter. So, I mean, I, I don't tweet because I find Twitter is, yeah, but it, it is good to, you know, the problem is that people often change universities so quickly that you will never have to write email address, or you always mm -hmm. have, maybe you can of course Google them, but I would say uh, keep in touch somewhere where you can just always say, hey, I don't know, I'm, I'm interested in doing so, or shall we collaborate or what do you think? And it reaches them because, uh, uh, if it's LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever it is, that would be useful, I think. Uh, and otherwise, well, with, with, um, with Liverpool, I do still have, of course, contact because of my supervisor and, and the project. So we're also, I'm waiting if, uh, if a volume is being put together. And to be fair, I would just think, you know, I would try to be authentic. I think it doesn't help if, if people tell you, yeah, that's a great strategy with, I always go to the bar and talk to everybody because maybe you're not the type of person. And I have also decided 
I'm not going to write to people like, hey, let's, let's collaborate on this. So, yeah, and let's, let's meet maybe, and you never meet, and you just, you just feel bad. So I would say go with the flow. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, with China, I'm, I'm still in contact with the former um, team leader because I like her just as a human being, you know. And we talk, so, you know, how's the situation, how is this? And I, I think, yeah. I mean, is you know, I have always been an untypical PhD, untypical. So it's difficult. So more, so, so more streamlined people will give you a different uh, advice. That's an um, interesting approach to networking, or uh, a good, uh, maybe a good approach to networking. That uh, you network because you really uh, want to be in contact um, and and have something to share with each other. Amelia and Isabella, I want to give um, you the chance to make any final remarks if you want, <laughs> or just say how you um, what your impressions of this conversation are. Isabella, you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I thought it was really, really nice and really interesting um, because we had a platform that would otherwise not have existed, I think. Um, because we do kind of similar stuff, but uh, it's not, yeah. It, it's not the same, so we would have never met otherwise, I think, maybe. <laughs> so it was really nice and interesting. And also, um, I, I find it very um, comforting uh, to hear what you have to say about moving and about um, doing research abroad, um, far from family and, and friends and, um, yeah, that are... Um, things we all uh, learned and <laughs> um, things that are, I don't know, common in our fields or wanted, um, but um, yeah, they, they come with difficulties also. Um, and so it's, it's really nice to uh, stay in touch and hear what, what others who made the same um, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> experiences and, um, I have to say yeah yeah no I'm so glad this conversation could be organized I mean it's sort of fun to hear about how things work in all sorts of different places and sort of you know what I think of as normal is you know actually just like one very specific way of doing things and so it's fun to hear from people, um, especially people like Helga, who, you know, you've experienced so many different institutions um, in you know, a very like young career. And so it's just fascinating to hear your experiences and um, yeah, sort of your tips on moving and, um, you know, keeping like some form of, of happiness and research productivity in the middle of all that. Um, yeah, that's really nice. We can do this. I mean, what with yeah, I feel like ever since COVID, it's actually like, it's sort of nice having these like digital convos. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Amelia. Um, yeah, and it would be lovely to continue the conversation maybe in a face-to-face -face, uh, opportunity. So uh, Helga, if you are coming to Austria, let us know. <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> cool, cool. I would be authentically interested mm -hmm. to network with you. <laughs> And authentically interested to talk about crib time in the monastery with Amelia. And I'm just thinking how we could make this happen, but uh, not sure yet. At this moment, it is one past two. And so that means I thank uh, the three experts here to, for taking the time to do this. And I thank the audience for listening to us and uh, invite all of you again uh, to May 23, uh, where there will be the last uh, post talk of this season. Uh, and the focus will be on tax law and we will go to Antwerpen. And I'm sure Belgium is also really interesting. Uh, and Helga, maybe you want to join in again. Uh, and all of you as well. Um, and Martina, do you want to say a goodbye as well? Um, yeah, goodbye also from my side. Thank you to all of you yeah for joining and yeah hope 
hopefully we see us next time on May 23rd again. Looking forward to it. Wonderful. Then uh, we can close this meeting and turn the recording off. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.